It is difficult to find any other six yards of fabric that embodies so much pain, misery, exploitation, excellence and triumph. It is also difficult to find any other dress form that manifests history, geography and an extremely complex ancient culture in such a profound manner. Sari, the Indian national dress is all this and a lot more. There is considerable controversy about establishing the antiquity of the sari. Artifacts, paintings and writings by early travellers clearly indicate that sari in some form or the other has been there in the Indian subcontinent for over 2000 years. The present style of wearing a sari has a more recent origin. It is believed that in 1920 a royal family engaged a French designer to evolve a new style of wearing a sari. The stitched blouse was the outcome of his creative exertions. Prior to that, the Indian women considered wearing a stitched cloth or tailored cloth as impure. Hindi films have contributed a lot in popularizing this style of wearing a sari. Till a few years ago, the Indian film industry played a big role in popularizing the sari and bringing uniformity in the way it is worn. For long years, Film heroines wore saris and determined the course of fashion in the country. The impact is more obvious on the non-resident Indians who stay connected with their roots through Bollywood. They have provided patronage to traditional Indian saris and designs. Indian textile designs have drawn inspiration from religion, architecture, painting, sculpture, dance and even music. Weavers have worked in difficult conditions in different parts of the country to give expression to these wondrous designs and motifs. Why has the sari proved to be so enduring? Perhaps it has something to do with its versatility and the ease with which it settles around any woman, whether she is young or old, fat or thin. Also, the cloth is extremely friendly to the female form. The folds from its folds accentuate the natural curves of a woman. No matter what the material, georgette, chiffon, silk and cotton, the impact remains the same. But what is a sari? By the look of it, it is just a plain six yards of fabric. But in the hands of weavers, the cloth transforms into a canvas where they showcase their designs and colors by interplaying the warp with the weft or tana bana. Though homogeneous in many ways, the sari is influenced by its immediate environment, which lends a uniqueness that reflects the area of perception of its weavers. Cloth, colors, motives, even the way it is tied changes with region. This is nowhere more striking than the desert state of Rajasthan. Divided diagonally by the rocky Aravali range, the state has a history of droughts and famines. Fabrics here sport bold colors, which seem to compensate for the parched and cheerless landscape. Cities of Rajasthan like Kota, Udaipur and Alwar specialize in textiles. But it is Jaipur which has emerged as a major center for the tie and dye saris. The capital of Rajasthan prospered because of the patronage that the royal family gave to textiles. The Mughal Empire in neighboring Delhi and Agra too helped in leaving its colorful impress on textiles. The City Palace Museum in Jaipur provides evidence of the contribution that royalty has provided to textiles. The regal attire that has been put on display reflects the high quality of work that took place under the patronage of the old Rajas. None of the pieces in the museum predate the 19th century. Ruled till 1947 by the royal family, Rajasthan still remains a highly feudal society where the caste system colors every aspect of life. Textile, incidentally, is its most physical manifestation. Tie and dye is done by specific castes. For instance, the blue color or neel 
is handled only by a caste called Nilgar. Similarly, people engaged in block printing belong to a caste called Chippas. These Chippas are zealous about saving their skills and would resist all attempts by outsiders to encroach on their traditional craft. They have a tradition whereby sons from the first wife will be Chippas or printers and those from subsequent wives, Darzis or tailors. At any given moment, there were more printers than tailors, which clearly suggests that Chippas were a faithful lot. Bagru, located 35 kilometers, is a center for block printing in Rajasthan. Traditionally, it catered to the dress needs of the Banjara tribe. The block printing on the dress and saris reflected the objects of everyday life, neem leaves, beetle leaves, chakri, raisins and coriander leaves are some of the motives that find expression in Bagru. These prints are mostly done with the help of vegetable dyes and considered eco-friendly. The block makers, like the dyers, enjoy a very high status in the Sanganeri and Bagru scheme of things. The block makers are mostly carpenters called Bhatkare, one who gives shape to things. These blocks are made of shisham, gurjan and teak wood and are mostly half an inch deep. A block has one to five booties or flowers or vines. Bagru prints traditionally were big and Sanganeri small. These wooden blocks are manufactured now in Jaipur, Farukabad and Pethapur in Gujarat. The blocks made in Pethapur are considered to be the best. Quintessentially Rajasthani, the tie and dye technique is used in lending color to the chunari and orni, a long piece of cloth used by Rajasthani women to cover the upper part of their body. Chunari and Orni are the two symbols of womanhood and marriage. Rajasthani folklore is replete with references to it. The color of the Chunari is the color of Suhag or marriage. Every Rajasthani girl craves to wear the Leheria or Mothra in the month of Savan. Most of these styles draw their origin from nature with Leheria replicating the designs of the breeze on sand. Leheria is traditionally given as a gift during Holi and Tej festivals to loved ones. A frail defenseless man, clad in a homespun loincloth and a walking stick, had a clear idea about what would hurt the British mercantilist. Born in Gujarat, a state famous for its textiles, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi knew the power of the loom. He also knew how handloom bound the fortunes of a great mass of people of this ancient land. In Gandhi's opinion, Rejecting textile imports from Manchester and promoting self-reliance could hurt British imperialism. The spinning wheel or charkha became the symbol of a people striving for freedom. At the banks of the river Sabarmati in Ahmedabad, Gandhi set up an ashram to spread the values behind Swadeshi and self-reliance. The handloom sector's revival could be credited to this visionary who spun his two uneven spinning wheels to history. Domestic textile mill owners also benefited from Gandhi's campaign for self-reliance. The textile industry really boomed after India gained independence. Despite the growth of the textile industry in Gujarat, there remained certain centers of excellence where the finest of saris were made. Patan, a small town situated in the northwest of Ahmedabad, is one of them. Here, two families of salvis are strenuously trying to preserve a kind of patola which is not made anywhere else. Painstakingly, the Salvis create the magic of legendary double ikat patola. Textile experts believe that the double ikat is the closest that a weaver can get to perfection. Patolas are mostly woven in silk fiber. Its discerning and exclusive clientele determine the patterns used in the patola. The Hindu and Muslim communities had their own preferred patterns. As Islam was opposed to any kind of idol worship, the patterns used in the patola too were modern or abstract. These geometric designs were called burabat. 
The Hindus, however, preferred motives of flowers, elephants and parrots. The patola is always woven in plain weave. The loom is at times slanted to ensure that the light falls on the weave which is constantly adjusted. The design is set at the time of dyeing of the thread. The expertise of the salvies lies in mathematically calculating how warp and the weft would fit together to give a coherent design. Every day, 6 to 10 inches of a patola are woven. It takes anywhere between 2 to 3 months to complete a sari. And each sari costs over a lakh of rupees. There is no fabric as light, supple and vibrantly colourful as the patola. There is some confusion about the historical antecedents of the Gujarati patola. Kumar Pal the Raja was going to Puja at that time. So at that time, the silk clothes were used at that time. The patola was used at that time. तो इसीलिए कुमार पर राजा जब इधर हुआ करीब 800 साल पहले तो हमारा 700 फैमिली जो महाराष्ट्र में थे वहाँ से इधर लाके बसाया था कि जो लोग पटोला साड़ी का काम करते थे और पटोला बनाते थे इसीलिए वो 700 फैमिली इसलिए लाया कि उनको हर रोज एक पटोला चाहिए और पटोला बनाने में तो काफी टाइम लग जाता है इसीलिए उनको हर रोज एक पटोला जल्दी से मिल जाए इसीलिए 700 फैमिली महाराष्ट्र से इधर लाए थे और इधर बसाए थे और इसी टाइम से इधर पाटन में पटोला का काम चालू हुआ है द टाई एंड आई टेक्निक और बंधेज फाउंड इन राजस्थान सीम्स टू बी मोर इवॉल्व इन गुजरात फ्रेंजी ऑफ कलर्स एंड सिंप्लिसिटी ऑफ डिजाइन विच आर कैरेक्टरिस्टिक ऑफ द टाई एंड आई हैव अ पॉजिटिव रिलेशन विद द डेजर्ट काइंड ऑफ क्लाइमेट इट इज इजी टू आइडेंटिफाई अ पर्टिकुलर ट्राइब और कम्युनिटी बाय द चॉइस ऑफ कलर्स ऑफ बांधनी इट इज नॉट एन अनकॉमन साइट टू सी द एंटायर विलेज dressed in a particular kind of color. In Gujarat, besides cotton, other material is also used for bandhani. The satin weave called gajji is used for more expensive bandhani textiles that give a unique richness to its designs. The women belonging to the Marwari community mostly wear gajji saris that have the motives of elephants, dancers, or lotus flowers. Interestingly, the most prized possession of a typical Gujarati woman is not in silk but in cotton, the gharcholu. The gharcholu is given to a girl by a husband at the time of her marriage. She covers her head with it. One end of the gharcholu is tied to the man's shoulder cloth, symbolically linking them for life. The gharcholu is mostly in fine cotton and is divided into compartments by woven gold brocade. The gold check fabric is prepared in Porbandar. In the past, this brocade was brought from Banaras, highlighting the close link between centers of sari production. Badani work in Gujarat is done by the Khatris, who can be both Hindus and Muslims. Their origin can be traced to the Punjab. The Khatri community monopolizes both the production and marketing aspects of textile production. Bhuj in the Kach region is the main center of Bandhani. The Bindi is the starting point of Bandhaj. Patronage by royalty has often provided circumstances for the growth of textiles. Maheshwar is the ideal example where a sensitive royal family has taken great pains to revive an old art. Situated on the banks of the river Narmada, Maheshwar was conceived as a capital and a center of pilgrimage by its visionary queen Ahilya Bai Holkar of Indore in the 17th century. There are a number of mythological references about Maheshwar and its pristine beauty. History has it that Queen Ahilya Bai collected some of the best weavers from Gujarat and brought them to Maheshwar. Her effort to recapture the old glory began to show results. This little town became synonymous with high-quality textile art. Maheshwari saris were an eclectic exhibition of various ideas that these craftsmen brought to this temple town. The ancient walls of the Maheshwar temple, with the stripes and checks, have inspired generations of weavers. These carvings have helped in defining the Maheshwar weave. In Maheshwari structure and design, 
there is a bit of Banarsi, a bit of Gujarati and a lot of Chanderi. The Chanderi sari is different from the Maheshwari in the sense that it uses zari from Surat in the warp. It also uses Katan silk in the weft. The combination of the two has an ethereal effect on the fabric. Temples and ghats alone have not made the ancient city of Banaras. Nor has the great river Ganges. The great city has endured for thousands of years because of what it has provided to its local people. Substantial means of livelihood. Hinduism's diverse rituals provide opportunities to the people of the city to engage in a thriving commerce. Its status as a Hindu religious center attracted both wealth and talent. Craftsmen manufactured exquisite textiles including gold encrusted brocades that were used for decorating deities and human beings alike. For thousands of years, the faithful traveled from all over the Indian subcontinent to Banaras to buy its rich brocades. Even today, for many affluent Hindus, a red Banarsi sari for the bride is almost mandatory. Lord Buddha was draped in a Banarsi brocade after his death. Proximity to Sarnath made Banaras important for Buddhists too. For years now, Buddhist bhikshus have been covering the entire circumference of this stupa with yards and yards of textile. At some stage, the intricately carved designs on the stupa found their way to the looms of Banaras, lending a mythical quality to the skills of Banarsi weavers. <laughs> 